Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'd ahabat fillah continue on in our study of uh, the fiqh of uh, tahara purification we reach the second chapter in Imam Fulzan hafizahullah ta'ala in his book Malakhis uh, Fiqhia uh, in which he was talking about the the second chapter which is about the the pots the ruling uh, for the pots and clothes of disbelievers. Can you wear disbelievers clothing? Uh, can you drink out of the water utensils of someone who doesn't believe in Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So he says, pots could be made of iron, wood, leather, or the like. Meaning these are the utensils in the past. During the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they used to use water skins and things like this from animals. The original ruling is the permissibility of using such pots. That is to say, it is permissible to use every pure pot except two types so you can cook in, in, in any kind of pot except two he said number one pots made of gold or silver uh, and the pots having anything related to gold or silver such as being inlaid or plated with gold or silver or anything of the kind that makes pots connected with them uh, the exceptional case it, here is the pots inlaid with little silver for the sake of repairing them. Because uh, during the time of the Prophet ﷺ and after, they used, sometimes they used a little bit of silver to mend a pot that was cracked or something like this. He said, the legal proof of the prohibition of using gold and silver pots is the following hadith related by the group of compilers of hadith. Uh, do not drink in gold or silver vessels, nor eat in similar bowls, uh, meaning made of those same uh, gold or silver. For they belong to them in this world and to us in the hereafter. Meaning that in Yom al in the hereafter, in Jannah, you will be able to use uh, and benefit from those uh, pots and pans from the gold and the silver to eat in gold and silver utensils. And this also means like making wudu in, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, like some people who have a lot of wealth and they are extravagant in their wealth, they have solid gold faucets and things like this. Also, that's impermissible to use. In another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also says, he who drinks in silver vessels is only filling his abdomen with fire. Uh, when someone is legally prohibited to use, the prohibition is applicable whether this thing is used partially or totally. Therefore, it is prohibited to use pots inlaid or plated with gold or silver or containing anything related to these two materials, excluding the case of a pot inlaid with a little silver, as we said, uh, which is permissible as mentioned above. This is illustrated in the hadith related by al-Bukhari on the authority of Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu ta'ala anhu who said that the, uh, the cup of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa was broken and he fixed it with a silver wire at the place of the crack. Okay, so they used silver to fix it. Imam Anawi said, uh, commenting about this, rahimahullah ta'ala, rahmatul alayhi wa rahmatul wasiyah, he said, Muslim scholars unanimously agree that it is prohibited to eat or drink in such pots or even to use them in purposes related to eating or drinking. Uh, this prohibition of using or keeping golden or silver objects applies to both males and females, as the, uh, the one who is addressed by this prohibition is general. So the prohibition was, was am, it was general. So that means that includes male and female. There was nothing that specified that this was just for males or it was just for females, but instead it was a general prohibition. So this is what the ulama by looking and analyzing this uh, evidence, this is how they made us then bought or how they use this evidence. There is nothing specified for a certain sex in this concern except for the permissibility for women to make use of both the silver and gold for purposes of adornment for their husbands. So a woman can, of course, wear gold and silver, you know, in her rings or whatever. <laughs> and jewelry. On the other hand, it is permissible to use the utensils of disbelievers unless one knows that they are impure. In this case, one can use them only after washing them. So if you know that someone, they just ate pork on the plate um, and it hasn't been properly cleaned or what have you, then of course it needs to be cleaned before you, before you eat, you partake in it. The second category Imam Fozan mentioned, he says the hides of dead animals. It is prohibited to use them unless they are tanned. 
they need to be tanned. So that means that they need to be set in the sun and dried, you know, the process of tanning. Yet scholars differ regarding whether it is permissible to use them after tanning or not. So even the ulama uh, of fiqh, they differed with regards to even if it's tanned, whether you can use it or not. The sound opinion, which is maintained by the majority of scholars, is that it is permissible to use the hides of dead animals after tanning, due to the many sahih authentic hadiths indicating that. This is because their impurity is temporary. So it is removed by tanning. The Prophet والسلام, said that the, the hides of dead animals are purified by water and cords, cords leaves uh, of a certain kind of tree which is used for tanning. The Prophet والسلام, also said tanning is a purifying means for hides. As for the clothes of disbelievers, it is permissible to wear them unless they are known to be impure. This is because the original ruling on their clothes is that they are pure and they cannot be deemed impure out of mere suspicion. So this is very important. This is a qaida fiqiyya that Imam Fuzan has given us. Likewise, it is permissible to use whatever is weaved or dyed by the disbelievers for the Prophet ﷺ and his companions used to wear clothes weaved and died by disbelievers, and Allah, the exalted, knows best. So it shows us a very important fiqh principle that we can probably gain from this, is that the asl of the uh, the asl of mu'amalat ibaha, that the origin of of most of, of the things that we do in the in this life, and our clothing, uh, our transactions and so on the, the asl, the origin is that it's all halal it's all jayas, everything you want to wear rings, you want to wear certain clothes all of it's permissible but then unless there's a text or uh, there, there's a textual proof to show that it, it's impermissible okay so we know that certain types of hairstyles and certain things Normally, the asal is, is that it's permissible okay, to wear clothes. You want to wear jeans, you want to wear this. The asal is permissible. But there's other text to show, there's specific text to show that these things are impermissible or that those scholars have deduced from those texts to show that it's impermissible. For example, the Prophet ﷺ said, Men min hum. Whoever resembles a people, then he is from them. So that lets us know that resembling... Other non-believing people in their uh, their their dress and in their actions that makes that normal action which would be permissible impermissible. If you're wearing the baseball cap, you're wearing it to resemble the you know gangsters or whatever, or you know holding it to the side or whatever. As we see a lot of the shabab doing, they're really most of them are imitating uh, 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 people who they see in the movies and they see on uh, you know the athletes and they see the other youngsters who are non-muslim doing these activities and gangbangers and stuff like this it looks attractive to them to wear the sagging pants that used to be the style now it's a different style the skinny jeans okay all of these the the asl would be that it was permissible except from the bab of tashbi or it could be resembling a woman as the Prophet ﷺ cursed the men who resemble the women and the women who resemble the men. So wearing men's clothes, things that are exclusively for men, is impermissible for women. And likewise the other way, other way around. So a man, he can't wear a miniskirt. Okay, that we know that the, the miniskirt, aslan, or the skirt, aslan as a skirt, is something which is known for, it's a woman's dress. So a man wearing a woman's dress that this is impermissible. And and the reason why, al-illa, the illa for this, the reason why, the reason being, because it is a man resembling a, a, a woman, you know, being feminine, which the Prophet ﷺ said they are cursed. The women who try to be like the men are cursed, and the men who try to be like the women are cursed. So we have a specific text which shows us that that also, that foundation principle for this spe specific issue is now impermissible. You understand? Yes? No? Kind of? <laughs> yeah? Okay. Now, so what about, uh, you know, uh, 
So, let me think of another example. Well, no. Nah. Okay, okay, good. Men wearing silk shirts. Good. Good. So the asal would be the origin, you know, is that everything that is from the mu'amalat and, 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 uh, and, and, um, and uh, that's from mu'amalat and, and, and social, you know, social issues and transactions and clothing and things like this, is that it's permissible. Okay? But if a man, he wears silk, how does that fit into that? Well, we know because we have a specific text which mentions the tahrim, the impermissibility for a man to wear silk. So then it falls outside of that normal, that, that, uh, the normal ruling. Because we have another, a specific text which makes it impermissible for men to wear silk. So that's how we know it's haram. I have an example also, which I'm finding, but these, uh, they are, you know, Shia, some, uh, many of my students. And so I talked to one, I said, you know, hey, you've got tattoos. I said, this is, <laughs> you know, I, I talked to him and he told me, he said, he said, it's, you know, not, uh, not in my religion. So then I was quiet. I had to, you know, because I'm in, at my job, I can't get into those issues, but we had another discussion the other day because he had a new tattoo and he said he made money over the weekend and he tattooed people, making money, so he was happy. And I just said, ah, uh, you know, I said, nah, it's not permissible. But the asal is, is he doesn't even take from our text. And obviously we don't take from his text. So he is not, he does not feel bound by the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu where we have direct text which show that the one who makes tattoos and the one who wears the tattoos is cursed. But we see that this becoming a new trend uh, in the, in, now in some of them, in many of the Muslim world, many of the Muslim countries and Muslims around the world. And with that being the case, going back to the, 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 the ruling is we know that body art like tattoos is impermissible because we have a text. The Prophet ﷺ said, the one who is who does the tattoo and the one who is who who has a tattoo is cursed. So we have a specific text which makes the general rule, which you could say is an exception of the general rule, because uh, it's a specific text which mentions this uh, this issue. Okay. And there's many other issues, maybe wearing a gold ring for men, men wearing gold, okay, as we mentioned, you know, it's permissible for women, but for men, we have specific texts which mention the tahrim of gold for men. That's how we know. We know it from the sunnah. We know these things from specific texts, from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, authentic texts, would show us that it's tahrim. That's how we would know. It's not just from sitting and then we're just going to figure that out and, and we're going to figure out uh, divine wisdom and hikmah. No. We know this because we have a text. We have an asus. That's why it's so important uh, knowing and understanding the Quran and the sunnah of the Prophet because that's where we take our religion from. Our religion's not, it's not all going to be according to your intellect that you're logically going to come to these conclusions about what is halal and what's haram. No, you come, you, it's from qala la qala rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's because we go back to the Quran and the sunnah of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's how we know something is halal and something is haram. And how the ulama, they use that as a base to make, uh, to look at the evidences. And if something is not clearly in the text or, you know, uh, and requires their ijtihad, it requires them looking to the issue based on certain principles and deduce from the Quran and the Sunnah or Qiyas, Qiyas meaning that they make an analogy from another issue in the Quran and the Sunnah to make a ruling on something. So these are all complex affairs, but anyhow, we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. And until the next sitting, wa sallallahu wa sallam, ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.